Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Chelsea Smith. I am your learning and excuse me, learning and development specialist here at Action Benefits. And today we are going to talk about, like I said, consumer driven health care. Joining me today is one of my favorite account managers over on the individual team. I have Renee with me today to help me answer all of your questions. Um, Renee, give the audience what they want before we continue. Chelsea, good morning. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us today. I'm happy to be part of this uh, webinar. And if anyone has any questions, please reach out to our individual team. One of the account managers, we're happy to answer your questions. Thank you, lady. So um, if you do have any questions at any point during the chat or during the time that we're spending today, you can use the chat to have those questions answered for you. You have no need to wait and we'll get to your question as soon as we can. So let's just dive right into the outcomes of our session today. So by the time you are finished with our session today, you should be able to identify some of the key elements that make up those health savings accounts, um, identify the key elements of health reimbursement arrangements, and identify some key elements of flexible spending accounts. We are also going to get a little bit into some of those more niche um, spending accounts like those Qseras and ICRAs and stuff like that. Um, but we're the main focus today is going to be on those three big ones, right? Those HSAs, HRAs, and FSAs. So let's get into some of the details of our show today. So consumer driven health accounts or CDH accounts give employers and the um, people in these plans some additional flexibility in how they're going to spend their dollars on their health care. So we're going to talk about mostly some of the bigger ones today and then get in, like I said, into some of the uh, sh uh, smaller ones. So the chart on this screen is going to provide us kind of a brief overview of each type of consumer driven health account. And we'll go into the details a little bit later on in our show. But from this chart, you can notice that the main differences between these types of accounts is who can contribute to them. What can be done with the money that is in the account? and how long the money is going to stay in the account. So for example, some employers may elect to allow a 2.5 month grace period for FH, FSA funds, excuse me, and others might elect to allow some of that uh, money to roll over from year to year. They can't offer both and not either one is required of them, but there's some flexibility there, hence the word flexible savings or spending, excuse me, account. Health savings accounts might be used by consumers to do some of these things. They might pay for some qualified medical expenses, like over-the-counter items, as well as fees charged by providers and pharmacies. They can save for future qualified medical expenses. They can save for retiree health expenses. But remember, though, that some consumers who become eligible for, eligible for Medicare by turning 65 are no longer able to contribute to those health spending accounts, but they may continue to withdraw with them through the retirement years. We'll go over a little more of the details about that in a moment, but I think that's kind of important to point out when we're recognizing some of the differences between these accounts and when is it important to know certain facts about your account at certain times to know what you should be looking out for. So if we get into, we're going to start with um, health savings accounts first. So some of the advantages of these accounts are, accounts are as follows. So the first thing is the affordability. Um, so health savings accounts may only be paired with plans that are classified by the IRS as high deductible health plans, right? So although these plans have high deductibles, they generally have those lower premiums, right? That um, in comparison to some of the other plans that are on the market. And pairing that health savings account with these plans will give consumers some flexibility. And second, consumers have complete control over the funds that are deposited in this account. It's their money, their employer cannot claim any unused balances. And so consumers may withdraw and deposit money into those accounts whenever they want. And they don't need to worry about like cutoff dates, to use those funds because the funds at the end of the day belong to the person who holds the account, the consumer. HSAs are also portable. This means that the account will follow the consumer wherever they go. 
Um, so as long as they, and they can continue to contribute to that account, so long as they still have a health plan that supports a HSA, right? So if you move on to another job and you get a different insurance plan, so long as that plan supports HSAs, that money will then transfer into that plan, into that account, and they can continue to contribute to that account. Um, and if the account, um, is paired with not with not a let me try that again. If the account does not have a HSA compatible plan, the money doesn't go away. It still follows the consumer. Um, it just you're no longer able to contribute to that account. And we'll talk a little bit more about that detail later on. HSAs provide consumers some flexibility as well. There's no cutoff dates, those draw or use any funds, like we mentioned earlier. And members can choose to use the funds to pay for current expenses or save for future expenses, like an, ex an expensive operation. And we'll talk a little bit more about why you might want to do that in the future. These accounts also present consumers with savings and investment opportunities. Unused funds in these accounts can be invested in a range of financial instruments, like mutual funds, stocks, and bonds, stuff like that. They can provide consumers an opportunity to raise funds to pay for retiree health care. And then last but not least, HSAs are tax advantage accounts. Deposits, qualified withdrawals, and qualified investment earnings are all tax free. This can also make these accounts intriguing to those of us who want to find another vehicle to grow our wealth. They're also pretty affordable. Um, premiums for high deductible health plans are generally lower than other plans, like we mentioned earlier. So if you are selecting a plan that does offer an HSA, you're going to be looking at a lower month-to-month -month cost for your health care. And then we have that triple tax benefit like we talked about earlier. So contributions, and investment gains and withdrawals, our qualified medical expenses are tax-free. So when you put money into that account, you do not pay taxes on the money. And you do not pay taxes on the money when you withdraw that, that money from the account, so long as you are using it for a qualified medical expense. Okay, so lots of benefits to these HSA accounts. Oh, looks like we have a question in the chat. Let me take a look here. So where do we open HSA accounts? That's going to depend on your plan. Okay, so, um, so they usually are um, like partnered with a bank of sorts, and then that account is monitored by a bank or there's sometimes whole companies whose job it is to monitor those accounts um, and create them, maintain them, stuff like that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, hopefully that answers your question. The premium is paid to an HSA account, not to the marketplace. No, you still are paying a um, premium. That premium goes to the plan just like normal. Um, you would then you would then contribute to your HSA as you as you so choose, right? Um, just like a regular savings account, whenever you wanna put money into that, you would put money into that account. The premium still goes to the plan just like um, any, other, um, any other plan. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. If not, let me, let me know. That was just answered. Okay. So nearly anyone can contribute to an HSA, whether it is an employer or an employee or a family member or anyone else who wishes to help someone with their qualified health expenses. The only people who cannot contribute to an HSA are Medicare enrollees. Um, they can have an HSA that was carried over from before they were eligible for Medicare and they can still enroll in a plan that has an HSA attached to it. Um, if they're, you know, in an employer group or whatever. But they cannot benefit from the tax sheltered savings that an HSA would provide. They can withdraw um, from the same HSA to fund those qualified health expenses, but they cannot contribute. Some employers want to make, might want to make a yearly contribution to an employee's health savings account, and they are able to do that. That's very awesome if an employer chooses to do that. Um, but once the money enters the employee's health savings account, it is the employee's money. It doesn't. It no longer belongs to the employer. 
Um, you'll find out later when we get into HRAs, that might be a little different. So that's a big distinction. The money in an HSA does belong to the person who holds the account. If the employer makes a contribution to that account on January 1st, and the employee leaves the company on February 1st, that employee will still get every single penny of the money that is contributed to that account. So um, that's up to the employer how they want to deal with that information. They can choose to put all, like if they want to make a contribution and they make the contribution in January and the person quits the next day, that money belongs to them, or they can choose to funnel money in um, over like a schedule, however the employer wants to do that, or they can put in a lump sum, you know, however they'd like to do it. So the IRS publishes yearly guidelines that govern the contribution and out-of-pocket limits that HSAs and health plans are subject to. So these guidelines speak to the yearly contribution limits that consumers can make, and it also um, limits, talks about the catch-up contribution limits. So what that means is if someone is 55 years or older, um, they can contribute a little bit more to that HSA to like catch up, I guess, to some of our um, younger folks who might have had that account a little longer and might have more money sitting in that account. So they can contribute a little bit more to their account to, to catch up, but only $1,000 more. That number hasn't changed in the three years that I've worked in the healthcare industry that's been $1,000. Um, but the contribution limits and out-of-pocket limits have changed every single year. Um, and you'll notice that they did announce the new um, high deductible out-of-pocket limit and um, contribution limits about a month ago. So we do have the numbers in for 2025, which you will see on your screen. There is quite a difference here between this year and last year. So what happens when I leave a plan with an HSA? So if a consumer leaves a plan with an HSA, what, will, what happens to that money will depend on a few factors. So if they move to another insurance plan that also includes an HSA, that money gets rolled over into that HSA that they um, that's attached to the plan that they are now going to be enrolled in. If the consumer doesn't have a plan with an HSA, that money is still kept within that account and it can still be used for the same expenses that it was intended for. The money is still in the account and essentially will still function the same way it would but the consumer might need to pay um, some maintenance fees to keep the account open and must and that um, and much must have a compatible HSA plan to continue to contribute and add money to that plan. Um, and then of course, like we talked about earlier, the employer can contribute to those plans, but if obviously if the person leaves the place of employment, they're no longer gonna be contributing to that HSA. So those contribu contributions do cease from that employer of course, unless they then go to another employer that also puts in contributions. All right, it looks like we are up to our first knowledge check. Um, Renee, was there anything you wanted to add to the conversation before I start this poll? Oh, Chelsea, you're doing a great job. A lot of helpful information there. Just a couple of things you know, working with agents uh, over the years and all that and talking, it's always a best recommendation for um, members to save their receipts if they're, you know, uh, using their HSA funds to help pay for qualified medical expenses, you know, save those receipts, put them in an, uh, you know, we always like to describe an old shoe box, kind of save them, put them in the corner, just in case if you ever need to go back and get those receipts to show that, you know, you did pay for qualified medical expenses with the, your HSA funds. And also, uh, another question that comes up from time to time is, you know, for someone who might be brand new to an HSA, you know, how much should I, you know, contribute? I don't know where to start, right? When members or consumers say, I don't know how much to put into my HSA account if they're looking at that first year of going into an HSA. Um, you know, it, it depends for every uh, consumer, but uh, sometimes, you know, members can, you know, log into their uh, member portal through the carrier system and kind of see what they spent last year uh, out of pocket uh, for some of their medical um, expenses when it comes to their claims and all that to kind of give them an idea where to start or, you know, uh, just some information like that to kind of get an idea as to what they spent the previous year. And every year is different, but it gives members sometimes an idea to see what they kind of spend throughout the year. So. 
I'm glad I muted myself because I giggled when you said old shoe box because that's kind of that kind of is what it is. Right. It is. <laughs> um I liked your contribution about the idea of looking back. I've never heard someone suggest that before. That's really smart. I like the idea of going back in through that uh carrier portal, seeing what they spent on healthcare last year. And then maybe if you, you know, everyone's finances are different, obviously. But then um, trying to get to something, some number close to or similar to that amount, so that you know that you have your healthcare squirreled away, money like squirreled away for the next year. That's pretty helpful. I like that. Okay, so so we have Jana, fifty-seven and single. She is looking to maximize her HSA contributions before she retires. Which of the following would you recommend that she does as her health insurance agent? I'll give you a few moments to answer that question while I take a sip of water. So in this situation, um, I, I was trying to trick some of you and I didn't do it. I'm glad that I did not um, pull the wool over your guys' eyes on this one. So I, I predicted in my head that you would, you would pick A, but most of you picked D, which that's the answer I was looking for. Um, contribute the $5,300 over the course of the year as she can. Because as we know, because she is over 55, she does get an additional $1,000 that she can contribute to that account in comparison to her more um, or less seasoned, we'll, we'll call it that, her less seasoned counterparts at her um, in her plan so that she can kind of catch up to um, those contributions, right? So some of you answered B, and I don't think that's a, that's not a bad answer, I guess, um, but if you do the math, I don't believe that you would come up to the $5,300 um, if you did that biweekly check. Like, But I, I can see where your mindset is at for those of you who did put that answer in because you know, if you're lurking it with them, maybe in a financial planning type level and that's what she can afford to contribute, absolutely cool. Maybe that's what you come to the conclusion to do and you do that, great. But her limit is that $5,300 was what I was trying to get at there with this question. So. Make sure that if you are working with your clients with a plan that has um, an HSA and they are over 55, maybe kind of make sure that they're aware that, hey, you can contribute a little more than um, some of our other folks here and get that uh, tax shelter benefit that we talked about earlier. So let's move on to HRAs, HRAs, so health reimbursement arrangements. I've also heard them uh, be called health reimbursement accounts. So if you hear me say that, I'm sorry. I try to say arrangement just to be more, oh, the lights turn off on me, I'm sorry. I try to say health reimbursement arrangements whenever I can, just to be a little more um, differential between HSAs and HRAs, but I sometimes slip and I will say H health reimbursement accounts. So a health uh, a healthcare account that, bleh, we'll try that again. A health reimbursement arrangement or an HSA is a health care account where the um, employers will make ad additional contributions to the employee's health care costs. These accounts are employer funded and they're designed to reimburse employees for health care expenses up to a fixed amount. It's important to note that this money is tax free for the employer and the employee. So same kind of benefits as an HSA, you get you you get that. Um, lower premium plan and you the employer then instead of the employee can set some money aside for the employee to make sure that they're hitting all their medical bills. Let's talk about some of the more nitty gritty details here. So as we talked about just now, uh, plans that are paired with an HRA generally have lower premiums than non HRA counterparts similar to an HSA. So that makes some month to month savings for both employers and employees, right? Because if they're contributing to that health care cost for the employee, that helps out both parties, right? So HRAs also present employers with some funding control. They can choose which expenses to reimburse and when. For example, they might provide a yearly allowance for an employee to purchase their own coverage, or they could pair it with an HRA group health care plan and choose to contribute to an employee's deductible, co-insurance, other health expenses, what have you. There's also some financial flexibility for employers built into these arrangements. While there is a fixed maximum amount that employees could be responsible for, there is no fixed minimum. So these accounts don't have to be pre-funded. 
So in, in other words, employers um, must only pay expenses that employees made against the account. So in a period where employees don't submit as many claims or purchase less expensive coverage, the unused funds get returned back into that employer's budget. So let's say, for instance, you um, employers know that they only want to spend $2,000 per person on health care costs. They can either front load that account with $2,000 and say, okay, that's all you're getting. And then that person uses that $2,000 up and they know, yep, okay, that's, we've hit that mark. Or they can say, you know, every time you have a health account you, or a health pro, um, bill, you put it into that or health um, charge, put that against the account and then we'll pay it. And then once that account, um, if they don't hit that $2,000 mark, then that money goes back to the employer, not back to the employee. So that's why it's kind of beneficial for employers as well, because then they kind of get that money back, right? If it's not used. And just like we mentioned before, employers should be aware of the tax savings that are built into these accounts. Employer contributions to an HRA are exempt from payroll taxes and the reimbursements are tax-free as well. Employers seek to provide a health care benefit to their employees, but may want to avoid administering a group plan. These types of accounts are a really good fit. And then, like I said, we'll talk about the more nuanced versions of these HRAs in a minute, but that's kind of the broad overall idea of an HRA. So HRAs are owned by the employer, like we said. And only the employer can contribute to the account, unlike HSAs, where both can contribute to the account. But remember, if you were an employee, you probably wouldn't want to contribute to this account because the money, any unused money will then go back to the employer. So um, there is no obligation to have any money in the account at all. Um, but it can be helpful, like I said earlier, to front load those accounts at the beginning of the fiscal year. So that way, the, the you know how much money is budgeted into that account, and any money that comes back can just kind of be like a freebie to the company. So depending on the type of the account, the employer could choose how they want to fund this account, like we kind of talked about earlier. Um, the employer could choose to make the funds available at the first day of the year, and then the funds dwindle as they're used, or they can make them available weekly, monthly, however they want to do it. Depends on how the, the account is set up. Employers then receive regular invoices from their designated HRA administrator, which then identifies the amount that will be withdrawn from the account. Um, and there's no need to pre-fund them, like we said. And um, it's the money then again goes back to the employer. So any cash that flows in, and is not used, will then be returned to them at the end of the year. Okay, so in recent years, like I mentioned earlier, there's been some changing laws that kind of made a little more flexibility in the types of HRAs that employers can choose to have for their business. So these are listed here. Um, we can generally group these in the three distinct time periods. There's a little more like detail around the different types of accounts. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but we, I just kind of like to talk about them in this slide in the order in which they were created. Um, Cause that just makes the most sense to me. So the Affordable Care Act is the first one that kind of changed that a little bit as we know that shook up a lot, right? So the Affordable Care Act allowed for integrated HRAs, retiree HRAs and dental vision HRAs or sometimes also known as limited purpose HRAs. Then after the pass, passing of the 21st Century Cures Act in 2017, employers were permitted to implement qualified small employer HRAs or QSERAs. Took me a really long time to figure out how to pronounce that acronym, um, but I can now. And then finally, regulatory changes made in 2020 give employers two more options they can consider, and that is individual coverage HRAs or ICRAs and accepted benefit HRAs. So we're going to talk a little bit more about each one of these individually right now. So integrated HRAs have been around for a while since the implementation of the ACA and are fully integrated with a group medical plan. 
They require employees to be enrolled in that plan. Each plan and carrier may have its own specific rules for configuring and administrating the arrangements. And we, if you want to know more about each individual plan, you probably should contact that individual plan to see what the exact rules for each one would be. Retiree HRAs are built to support retirees with their health care costs. These plans are not required to be integrated with any medical coverage at all, which means that retirees have some discretion in how they choose to use these funds. Employers may select one or two options for funding these accounts. And the first one is a rollover, which allows the employer to transfer all current HRA funds to an RRA or a retirement reimbursement account. The second option is that the employer could make a one-time contribution to the retiree's account at retirement, in effect like a retirement gift or a parting gift to help that retiree with health expenses after they are no longer with the company. The ACA also permits employers to establish dental vision HRAs or limited purpose HRAs. And as you probably can guess, uh, these funds are only able to be used for dental and vision expenses or whatever type of purpose the HRA might have in the name of the HRA. So then that brings us to the 21st Century Cures Act in 2017. This made Invent, or this invented QSERAs essentially. So QSERAs provide additional financial flexibility to employers with less than 50 employees. These accounts are intended to allow employers to reimburse employees for the premiums they paid in the individual under 65 market. Other out-of-pocket expenses like co-pays and co-insurance could also be reimbursed through these accounts, subject to other rules depending on like, like the plan and all that. It should be noted, though, that employees are not required to enroll in a health plan when taking advantage of this account. In short, these plans allow small employers to provide their employees with a health care benefit without necessarily having to administer their own group health care plan. This is a great option for those really small businesses, I think, that maybe have like one or two employees or a very small amount. Under 50 is the law, but maybe very small ones um, that want to provide some health care but don't want to administer any plans, they don't want to spend time doing that, or they want to give their employees options to do whatever they'd like with that money as long as it's used for a healthcare purpose, right? So maybe they a person doesn't want, maybe one of the employees doesn't want to have a healthcare plan at all, but they go to the, you know, maybe they're young and they only go to the doctor once a year for a physical or the sniffles or whatever. The employer could put some money in that account. That person could use that money to go see. The employee could use that money to go see the doctor every twice a year, and there you go. No need for health care. Or they could put money in that account, and that person could go off to the, um, the marketplace, get themselves some coverage there, and use that money to pay their premium. However, they like to do it. So long as um, so long as that money is being used for a health care purpose, they're not required to have health care to have that plan. Um, as of right now, it is $1,650 for a single person and $12,450 is the max that can be contributed to a QSERA in 2024. Okay. So now we have an ICRA. So individual coverage HRAs or ICRAs can be thought of as a blend between integrated HRAs and QSERAs. So ICRAs are available to employers of all sizes, um, but they require that employees be enrolled in a plan on the individual marketplace or a Medicare plan. So this is very similar to a QSERA. The only difference is with an ICRA, um, the person does have to have healthcare coverage to use this account. But the other flip side is any size employer can use this type of account. HRAs, um, accepted benefit HRAs may generally be used to reimburse employees for any benefit that the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act defines as accepted. So this includes things like COBRA premiums, short-term medical plan premiums, dental and vision premiums, stuff like that. This last one might kind of seem redundant when we talk about um, those other type of HRAs that were around that started with the ACA. And that it, that's kind of true. Um, it was just kind of these were expanded in 2017 to cover um, other things beyond dental and vision coverage. 
So lots of different options um, we've made available uh, in around 2020 for companies who would like to make uh, contributions to the health and wellness of their um, employees just in different ways. So recent regulatory changes have been implemented that may make HRAs attractive to employers, but they only represent one option, right? So what happens if you leave a plan with an HRA? So unlike HSAs, uh, like we talked about, you probably could have guessed the answer to this because all of the funds in that account belong to the employer, not the employee, unlike HSA where the money belongs to the employee, all of the money goes back to the employer if um, the person leaves the HRA and, or leaves the plan that is um, attached to the HRA. Uh, money always belongs to the employer in the case of an HRA. All right, so we've, we've hit another knowledge check. Um, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Doesn't look like it. Um, Renee, is there anything that I missed or you'd like to add before we um, start this knowledge check here? You know, Chelsea, one thing just to maybe add is um, when agents and their um, clients are working with an HRA administrator, um, it's it's always recommended uh, during the implementation process maybe to just uh, confirm uh, for peace of mind, how will the member be reimbursed? Will the member be reimbursed uh, by the HRA administrator by submitting the proper documentation to the HRA, HRA administrator, or will the HRA administrator be re uh, submitting, you know, a reimbursement to the provider direct? So it's always good during that whole implementation process when you're, you know, the HRA is being um, implemented or so just to confirm how will that work and just properly communicate that, um, especially if it's like an employer group, how that's going to, how, you know, the members uh, are aware of that, how will that be um, processed behind the scenes? And also what documentation, if, if uh, an employee needs to submit the documentation, what is needed so that they know that uh, and have that information ready before the plan goes into effect so that they know where to send it, um, and what documentation is needed. Right, that takes total sense to me because you don't want to end up in a situation where your employee is at the doctor or they get a bill or what have you and they don't know how to get it covered then that money doesn't get used because then like, what's the purpose, right? Um, right. Yeah, I've heard of debit card ones too, I believe. So, and that would be super nifty for someone to be able to just swipe a debit card and get that used. So lots of different options. Um, yep. Just make sure whatever the option is that they're aware of it, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Exactly. All right. I'm going to throw up another question onto the screen for y'all to answer for me to make sure I am doing my job properly. So we have our friend Asagai, and he would like to set up an account to help his seven employees pay for health insurance costs, but he does not want to offer any health insurance to his employees at this time. He doesn't have the administrative overhead to do something like that. So is he able to do that? Is he able to help his employees out by giving them some sort of something or other to maybe give them some health care assistance? I'll give you a second to lock in your answer while I take a sip of water. You guys were quick with that one. So yes, Everyone understood this portion of our show. The answer is B, right? He can set up a QSERA and contribute up to the $1,550 mark on each employee's behalf um, because you do not need to have a health plan to have a QSERA, right? Um, integrated HRA, you would need um, that employer health plan to have an integrated HRA um, and see, you know, we know that that's not correct. You have QSERAs and ICRAs do exist. And um, D used to be correct. You used to have to have more than 50 employees, but then in 2017, we invented QSERAs, Qualified Small Business. Okay, so now we are on the final portion of our show today, the FSA, the Flexible Spending Accounts. Um, I had one of these when I was a teacher. 
um, back in the day. So I know I have a little bit more, you know, firsthand experience with these in comparison to HSAs. I did, I've never personally had an HSA myself, but FSAs I know a little more about at a personal level. So FSAs allow employees to set aside money on a pre-tax basis for qualified medical expenses, including medical, dental, vision, deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. Um, as you might guess by the name flexible, they are a little more, less rigid than an HSA. So similar, but we'll see the differences in a moment. Well, I do that once a, uh, once a presentation. I'm so sorry. So FSAs provide an opportunity for employees to offset other out-of-pocket costs associated with their health care plan. Deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance can all be funded from these accounts. Um, we should note that FSAs may be paired with any type of health plan, not just a high deductible one. FSAs also provide employees with flexibility in how they use their health care dollars. Employees can use the funds for expenses beyond typical health care expenses, orthodontics, sunscreen, family planning items, or some examples like this. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a you know, exact how, like a bill, it can be an item. I think of stuff that you stock your medicine cabinet with. Um, but it is important to make sure that you look at that list. They will give you like a list of stuff that's uh, that qualifies when you get an FSA. So make sure you're cross-referencing that list. Make sure that it is something that is covered, but you can't get that stuff covered with an FSA. FSAs also present an opportunity to realize some of those tax savings contributions and withdrawals for qualified expenses are tax-free, just like our other two accounts. And FSAs can also provide employees with some reassurance. So with a medical FSA, the employer makes the employee's annual contribution almost about available at the start of every plan year, and the employee can take full advantage of that amount right away. Payroll deductions throughout the year are used to make the employer whole. However, this does present some risk to the employers since there is no legal mechanism to recapture those funds um, as long as they're used for a qualified purpose. So, aka, um, all money for an FSA gets loaded into the accounts at the beginning of the year. That person could then use all of the money the next day and they could leave the company on the third. And too bad that money's gone. The employer cannot like sue them for the money back, or there's no way to get that money back to the employer. That's just snooze you lose, that money goes to that person. Um, however, the opposite side is that money does eventually expire. And we'll talk about that in a second. But if that money expires, um, the money goes back to the employer, not back to the employee. So it might all come out in the wash if someone doesn't use any money in that FSA. So FS, FSA contributions may only come from two sources. Employees may contribute on a pre-tax basis. Employers may also contribute in addition to whatever employee contributions they choose to pre-fund. Some carriers and plans do set a limit on employer contributions, but you know, you'd have to check each individual plan to see if and what those limits might be. So FSAs are owned by the employer. So employee, employers have to make a decision to make, uh, or let me start that sentence again, I'm sorry. Um, employers have a decision to make about what happens to any unused FSA funds at the end of each plan year. There's kind of three different options. They can either use it or lose it, right? So employers can reclaim any unused funds and put that pre-funded tax benefit into the account for the next year. So let's say the amount, the limit is $100. Um, there's $75 left in the account. They can just like reload it back to the 100, put 25 in. They don't have to put the other 75 in. Employers can choose to provide an optional 2.5 month grace period to their employees. And during that grace period, employees would still have full access to all the funds for both the previous year and the last and the new year. Um, and they get that 2.5 month time to use that money. And last but not least, employers could also elect to allow employees to carry up to $640 of their FSA funds into the next year in 2024. So these options are mutually exclusive, though. So each option, you know, whatever, but only one can apply. You cannot have a two-month grace period and carry over 
um, you get one or the other. And every employee, and it goes to every employees. You can't say, oh, Renee, we're going to let her have the $640 every um, carry over every year, but we're going to let Charles just have that 2.5 month grace period. It, every employee has to be the same. So what happens when I leave a plan with an FSA? Um, employers set up and own the FSA. So that money goes back to the employer, kind of like we said earlier. But if you uh, the exception would be if you are one of those employers that chooses to use that um, rollover, that 640 rollover, rollover dollars would then roll over into the next year. Um, but once that person, if that person leaves the company, that rollover money does not go to them. It goes back to the employer. Money at the end of the day, if in an FSA, is owned by the employer. And employees are not required to give back the spent funds if they leave. So that's the other side of it. All right, we have one more knowledge check before we continue. Unless, Renee, do you have anything you would like to add? Um, nope, Chelsea, you're doing a great job. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, again, this is one of those FSA, you know, save your receipts. If you're using your um, uh, FSA funds uh, to pay for your qualified medical expenses and all that stuff, save those receipts, put them away uh, in case you ever need to um, retrieve those receipts for any purpose. Um, if you are also, if a, if a member um, is, you know, they need to submit a, a receipt to the FSA administrator for reimbursement and they, you know, um, they need a receipt, they, you know, reach out to the your provider's office and request maybe an itemized receipt that they can get the uh, enough information to submit that to the FSA administrator. Um, also, again, when before, during the implementation process, it's you know always recommended for an agent and the employer to know how that FSA you know uh, what's the process like. Will the members need to submit the receipts directly to the FSA administrator? Will there be a debit card that the uh, employees have? So just kind of make sure all your questions are answered before the plan goes into effect, so that the agent and the employer know how that will work. Um, and with the FSA administrator. I love that advice because I will say, as someone who had an FSA back when I was teaching, our agent did nothing to make sure I understood what this account was for. And then the beginning of the year, I got this like debit card in the mail and said it was my FSA. I'm like, I don't know what this is for. I'm like, I didn't open this account. This is, what is this, a bank? Am I getting scammed? And I was all upset. And I had to have a girlfriend of mine explain it to me. That could have been money I saved, especially as a teacher. That could have been money that was in my pocket. And if my agent would have went through with me and explained these things to me, I would have been so thankful to him. The debit card, let's say if the member receives a debit card and that's how they're going to be using that uh, to pay uh, if they're at the pharmacy. If they're also buying items that are not allowed, um, right? They're not allowed. That transaction yeah. might not go through. And uh, sometimes also, uh, you know, transactions might not go through, even if they don't, if they have stuff that, you know, is allowed, if they're picking up a prescription or something, if the card is not working again, that in that situation, um, an agent can always, you know, find out during the implementation process, you know, who does the member contact if the card isn't working when they're at the pharmacy, just so that, again, they have that information ahead of time uh, so that they are aware. Cause sometimes that, that happens. Uh, when someone's at the pharmacy trying to pick up, a, you know, their prescription and their debit card is their FSA debit card it might not work. Yeah, once I got the hang of it, um, they reminded me a lot of I worked in grocery stores before I taught and then came here, obviously. Um, it reminded me a lot of WIC cards. So it's really important to make sure and, you know, maybe they've gotten better since then, since I had it and maybe they go through. I don't know. But in the meantime, like, just make sure whatever the procedure is that your clients know it so that when they go there, it's a smooth interaction for them. And then they see you as this problem solver because they kept you. Um, you saved them some money. All right. Anyway, so knowledge check. Jody wants to get a surgery that costs thousands of dollars, thousands and thousands. Eyeing the benefits of a pre-tax savings account, ooh, she contributes the max she can to her FSA and plans to have enough money in that account in about three years. What advice would you give Jody regarding this situation? This is another one where I'm kind of trying to trick you a little bit. So um, take a minute, answer that question, and I will be back in a second. D, and I was trying to get you to pick A because I thought 
that you would make sure that that you'd be thinking more about qualifying the expense, but really it's D because as we know, unless the employer chooses that rollover, and if they choose that rollover, only 640 can roll over at a time. So if she has a, you know, four or $5,000 surgery, she's never gonna hit um, that amount because that rollover is not, that money's gonna go back to the employer. It's gonna get it's only that um, 640 will be rolled over, right? So don't use this FSA account for saving up for a huge surgery like that. Because that money is not going to be there. Okay, so this chart we visited a few moments ago at the top of the hour briefly summarizes the functionality of consumer durer health options um, to both employers and employees. It's not exhaustive as we learned today, but can kind of help you start a conversation with maybe the person picking out benefits for the group or maybe um, a client who is looking at a high deductible health plan on the marketplace, something like that, get the conversation rolling. And then you can help direct them as the agent as you so choose to what is best for them. All right, so that's about everything that I have for you today. Um, thank you so much for coming and spending some time with me and getting to know these things to help your clients out to the best of their your ability. I appreciate that for you and your clients appreciate that as well. Um, and then Renee, if you have anything else you'd like to say before we uh, part ways this morning? No, not today. Uh, Chelsea, you did a great job. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. And if you need, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team and we are happy to help. Thank you.